State of the Union edition of Decoding Fox News, and I'm your host, Juliet Jeske. Each week, I watch and analyze a whole heck of a lot of Fox News and then break it down. I watch all the Fox News you'd never want to. This past week has been epic. I think this is going to break records for me because Tuesday alone, Tuesday alone, I watched three hours of Fox and Friends and nine hours, although it wasn't all in one day. But I captured and analyzed nine hours of Super Tuesday coverage in addition to the five and Hannity. And that's just one day. That was just one day. Then we're moving on to the State of the Union. And I had a fiasco happen on the State of the Union uh, address. I was trying to catch up with some backlogged shows I haven't watched yet. And um, so I was DVRing. I DV, set my DVR on YouTube TV. And it when I searched for Fox State of the Union... It showed me a graphic. I said, that must be it. I said, yes, record, set it, forget it. Watched it while I was working on other stuff, kind of what I do all the time. And then I, when I was going through it, I knew something was wrong. And I figured out, because it didn't have any A-listers on it, there was just not a very large panel. It just, it didn't feel right. And I thought, this cannot be right. I saw a clip from Hannity, and his clip had a totally different cast and I went I don't have the right version Fox does this sometimes for these like big events they'll do more than one version and the version that I was watching was the Fox 5 version which is like a local which is bizarre that they had a separate one but they did and it was Shannon Bream and it was just two people commenting and you could tell it wasn't the full Fox News experience so in order to find the correct version, I had to do tremendous amounts of searching because once it's aired and it's a special, you can't get it again. So I found half of it on Fox Business, literally just half of it. And then I found the other half on a bootleg that someone else had put on YouTube, just crazy regular YouTube. And they had just cut it off after 45 minutes awkwardly, just boom. But I got what I needed. And then I stuck them together and just was like, I cannot believe... I had to, I mean, it took hours to just get a decent copy of this. So, (laughs) oh my goodness. Um, And I should be having uh, for tomorrow a Super Tuesday, Super Nerd, that's what I'm going to call it, the Super Nerd deep dive of nine hours of Fox News coverage for Super Tuesday, because they just kept it going to like 4 a.m. And I captured all of it in real time, live, because I'm nuts. So next up, We're just going to get right into it. So the Democracy 2024, that's what they were calling these, State of the Union Address pre-show before the speech was 25 minutes long. That was from the start at 9, and then the President of the United States was late getting to uh, the House chamber, and he was also late starting the speech. So they were just kind of riffing for a very long period of time. The anchors on the show were Brett Baer and Martha McCallum. They were the co-anchors. And then you had Peter Ducey of Fox News um, was the correspondent. Then for the panel, you had Dana Perino, Harold Ford Jr., John Roberts, Britt Hume, all of Fox News. And then, of course, you had Representative Kevin McCarthy and Brandon Judd. And he's with the Union for Border Patrol Agents. It's technically the National Border Patrol Council. So another fun bonus is that uh, rarely does this happen, but for the State of the Union, PBS and Fox News lined up perfectly and that they offered me the exact same amount of uh, commentary. So I was able to compare them word for word, um, which is fun. There's a chart at the end where I compare words in the transcript. And um, so that's going to be interesting. And basically what I did is I just pulled some clips that kind of give a shape of how both networks covered the same event. So we're going to start with Britt Hume on Fox News. You know, we've seen so many stumbles and, you know, so many awkward moments, uh, you know, him falling down, is getting caught in the middle of sentences, losing his train of thought and all that. I would not discount the possibility at all that the president will come in here tonight, be very well rehearsed, very well prepared, very well rested, and will deliver a speech with a lot of energy and clarity, after which, of course, we, can, we will watch while the hosannas from Democrats and their allies in the media will ring down upon him, saying that, it, that that puts the senility and the age and acuity issue to rest. It doesn't, but that's what I suspect we'll hear. So not exactly surprising commentary there by Brett Hume, but still we're getting a sense of basically how they're setting this up. So no matter if, if Biden is perfectly polished, 
pulls this off, he's still terrible, basically, is what they're saying. Like, this is just rehearsed. It's the only reason why he's any good. He's still terrible. Now, three minutes in, Brett Baer, who's supposed to be a legitimate journalist on Fox News, starts quoting Donald J. Trump from Truth Social. Now, why is this relevant? I don't know, but he decides this is going to be a good idea. Uh, saying, quote, the president is very substantially late. Not a good start, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure he had very important things to do, but he is now just getting into the car. They will have to drive very, very quickly. You just don't want to be late to the State of the Union. They need Mario Andretti to be at the wheel of the limo. I think it's going to be a play-by-play -play all night long. So Trump had planned on doing a live fact check of Biden's statements on Truth Social. They didn't talk about that on Fox. They didn't mention that, but I just picked that up because it was like all over Twitter that Trump was planning this big, I'm going to do a live fact check of every misstatement that Biden makes. Well, that didn't happen. And apparently, according to reporting by the New York Times, users on Truth Social reported 3,000 outages on the site by 9.30 p.m., according to Down Detector, a website that tracks user reports of web disruptions. Trump's fact-checking amounted to the former president mocking President Biden and Vice President Harris. So it was just him insulting them. There was no fact-checking. It was a complete joke. So um, then we move on to, and this always cracks me up, when anybody on Fox talks about how uh, Democrats are being negative or Biden's being negative because... All Fox News pushes all day long is fear, outrage, and paranoia. Basically, the canon of Fox News is the economy is terrible. Everyone's going to turn everyone in your life trans. Um, you know, run for your life. The woke, woke monster will get you and cancel culture will destroy your life. And when that's not destroying your life, we're getting invaded by migrant caravans who are going to change the country forever. And then you're going to be broke, sad, broken, and they're not going to let you be a Christian. Boom, Fox News. That's pretty much all they push. Oh, and crime. Crime, 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 and crime. Crime, run. Run for your lives. And we're also about on the brink of World War III with various countries. That changes. Not Russia, though. Not Russia. It's usually, you know, the one that's obviously threatening the rest of the world. No, it's China. The country that eh, might be, I don't know, but they sell a lot of stuff to the rest of the world, so I kind of doubt that. But anyway, moving on, we move on to Martha McCallum pushing more of this, like, negative, negative, negative. You know, people do look to these speeches. They are opportunities to lift up the country. And what we see in these numbers, 70 percent think the country is going in the wrong direction. Um, it's really astonishing how down people are down about the economy, very down about what's going on at the border. They feel like there's a loss of control in the country. Again, McCallum, you and others on your esteemed network say on a daily basis that the United States is being invaded by a secret army of migrants and that our economy is collapsing, even though it isn't, and that we're on the brink of war. Maybe that's why they have negative ideas. Maybe. Just saying, just throwing it out there. Just Throwing it out there. Next is Dana Perino on a similar, similar angle. Hello, but it's interesting that you say that because the mood in the country is pretty dark. And I feel like, in a way, people have sort of tuned out Washington. They don't think it's going to help them. They don't see or hear from Washington, like, how things are going to get better for them. And also the chaos that President Biden <coughs> talks about when the Trump years. I think that when you see people say, 72% of people say the country's going in the wrong direction, that's because they feel like their lives are chaotic now. Because we all want to return to the nonstop chaos that is Donald J. Trump. It's amazing that they, it's like gaslighting and projection all day long on Fox News. You're really saying that Biden is chaos and Trump is stability? Is, is that what we're saying? The man who's freaking out on a daily basis. Uh, next up, we move. We're going back to Trump because you know they can't. They can't quit him. They can't quit him. Um, and this is John Roberts now claiming. And I, I fear this is going to be. There's going to be more and more and more of this as we get closer to November. But John Roberts openly calls. And again, he's supposed to be one of the legit journalists on Fox News. Openly calling out the fact that Trump is responding to what he's watching on Fox News. That Trump is watching Fox News in real time and then writing about it on Truth Social. 
Here we go. Again, months of this. I think somebody is watching because we mentioned a second ago that the Democrats are going to fight this election on abortion. Republicans are going to try to fight it on immigration. Donald Trump just put out on True Social, there's nothing he can say, Biden, that could absolve him from letting 15 million people into our country illegally. He'll probably blame me, but I had the safest border in history. You know, so if, they, the form, if the former president the wants to call in, we're happy to put him, <laughs> yeah. instead of reading the Truth Social posts. He just might. Yeah, he may just might. Yeah, exactly. So, unfortunately, Donald J. Trump is already starting to do this. He did this on uh, Super Tuesday. He called into Fox and Friends and talked at length. And it's just like, oh, here we go now. Here we go. And this network actually has the nerve to say that other networks are biased or lack objectivity. I, I, I can't even. He literally just calls into Fox and Friends. He's like, how are you doing? I'm, I'm Donald J. Trump. I'm just going to talk about how amazing I am and how horrible everybody else is. Donald J. Trump, but I'm a victim. You know, like, just come on. This last one is Kevin McCarthy. Just the pettiness here is why I included this. So this is, again, Kevin McCarthy, who's about to retire from Congress just for no reason, picking on President Biden for the speed in which he walks, because that's very important. One thing I've noticed from all the presidents, President Biden takes more time walking down and walking out. He literally waits till everybody leaves. I've never seen quite anything like it. Now they were stretching a bit here because they uh, were kind of riffing for 25 minutes because the speech didn't start on time. So they were getting a little desperate, but when you're just going, he, he takes a long time to walk in and walk out. And they were talking, both networks weirdly talked about this, is that Biden stops to talk with people, both in the way, as he comes into the the building and as he leaves the house chamber he just has these little mini conversations with people and they take selfies and he's the mr i'm going to talk to everybody kind of guy and of course fox being fox they're just you know completely oh my god this is terrible i'm like okay whatever so they have the state of the union speech it lasts for one hours and eight minutes we won't be hearing any of that because we're going over the commentary uh, if you are a listener of this podcast, I'm sure you've watched the State of the Union. If you'd like to see it, there is a hyperlink in the newsletter. You can watch the whole thing. So the commentary after the speech is going to be 17 minutes and 30 seconds. And again, I pulled some quotes to kind of give you an angle. I'll briefly say I thought it was the best State of the Union uh, address that Biden's given. I do think it was important for the moment that we're at right now because I think He's going against a very aggressive opponent, and I think it makes sense for him to also appear like I'm not an old man. I'm not a doddering fool. Um, I'm here. I'm in charge. I'm going to take this thing. And I think that was a wise move by his part. Um, of course, on Fox, they did not agree with my opinion, <laughs> as you can guess. So we're going to start off with um, this is Brett Baer summing up the speech. President Joe Biden delivering a State of the Union address lasting just about an hour and eight minutes. It started off a little differently. Protocol says the Speaker of the House introduces the president with the words, it's my high honor and privilege to introduce the president of the United States. Speaker Johnson was ready, but President Biden dove right in uh, to that speech straight away. He started with freedom and democracy under assault. He pointed to Russia on the march in Ukraine, calling for funding and weapons for Ukraine right off the bat. He called out his predecessor former President Trump for, quote, bowing down to a Russian leader. From there, President Biden went to the January 6th Capitol riot, calling it the gravest threat to our republic since the Civil War, and he said that threat remains. That was the first 12 paragraphs of this speech in what many political watchers are calling one of the most, if, if not the most, partisan, kind of rancorous State of the Union address they can remember. Uh, it took about 40 minutes to get to the issue of immigration and really the exchange he wanted, Martha. Democrats wanted energy tonight. They wanted fight. Uh, it was delivered in a fast, forceful, sometimes yelling way at the end, reaching the dismount that he said the idea of America is why he's optimistic about the future. Yeah, he got it. So I would actually, uh, the reason why I clipped that is I actually think that's fairly accurate. Um, again, this is Brett Baer. He's from the legitimate uh, branch of Fox News, whatever that means. I think he tries to show some objectivity there and he tries to be honest. I still think he knows he works for a partisan network, but that was, you know, I, I, I don't think he said anything false there. It's just he described it pretty accurately. Um, now we're going to move on to Brett Hume. 
which this is funny because Brit Hume is 80 years old. And I mention that <laughs> because, of course, he takes a strike at Biden for being old. Well, I thought it was a good chance he would make a smoothly delivered, uh, mistake-free, no blunders, no stumbling speech tonight. Um, he was the theme of it, of course, was that the, the country's on a great comeback. Uh, for for a speech about a comeback, he didn't seem very happy about it, did he? He seemed angry. There was plenty of stumbling and slurring of words and all the rest of it that we've come to associate with him and taken as a sign of his senility and his advancing age and, and the effect that it has on a person. So I don't think he got out from under that at all. And I'm not sure that a person sitting at home tonight looking at the guy would think he was anything other than an angry old man. Now so an 80 year old uh man with a naturally gravelly voice who kind of sounds like he's always like asking for the manager just complained that an 80 or one year old man came across as an angry old man i mean that's just okay a little bit of self-awareness brit hume just a little bit uh would help here you could at least say well, you know i'm 80 or something it's kind of clear that you're not a young man. But anyway, that's fine. But it's that was a funny clip because if you match it with the clip he made before the speech, it's like, did you did you just read the same paragraph? Did you just did you watch the speech or did you already prepare that? You know, and I'm like, it was so funny because he basically said if he gives a well polished speech, well rehearsed speech, it'll be terrible anyway. And there you go. Thank you, Brett Hume. Moving on, this is Brandon Judd, and he's talking about he was directly asked. He's the leader of one of the unions for um, border patrol agents. And he endorsed the bipartisan um, legislation that is stalled. And here he is sort of explaining why he endorsed it. He says in this speech, the bill would save lives, bring order to the border. It would also give me as president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is over overwhelming. And then he points to your union endorsing the bill. So what you're saying is that's not the whole story. No, it, of course it's not the whole story, but he never gives us the whole story. There are certain points. The reason that we supported the bill is because it's better than the status quo. What we wanted to see is we wanted to see it go to the floor to be debated, to have amendments put in there to make that bill much better. It is not the perfect bill. We've never said it was the perfect bill, but it is better than the status quo. So that's actually not a terrible thing to say. He's basically saying we're not happy with the way things are. We did endorse the bill because the bill does make improvements. So, OK, uh, you know, he went ahead and ripped on Biden, hates Biden, yada, yada, yada. But actually, his words there are they don't really help the Republicans out, do they? Because he's saying at least this is an improvement. Why don't we pass this? Now, both um, networks made a big deal out of the interaction between Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, who was wearing a MAGA hat, which is against the rules. You can't wear a hat in the House chamber. And she just looked like, you know, she was dressed like like a MAGA cult member with the buttons and the cap. And she brought up Lake and Riley and she sort of yelled it at President Biden and the way she said it, it was hard to understand what she said. And he said Lincoln, which I think he just mispronounced Lincoln. And they all freaked out about that as if he got her name. Maybe, I don't know. I can't read inside the man's head. But as far as vocal gaffes are concerned, he was making those early into his career. He did have a stutter when he was a child. He overcame the stutter. But I think that might have something to do with the fact that he does tend to uh, kind of fumble on his words and he's he was doing that when he's a much younger man but they all act like this is a new thing and it's dementia and he's a both a doddering old fool and a mastermind that's the view of fox the the view fox news promotes of president biden so this is dana perino talking about that brief interaction between marjorie taylor green and biden yeah, okay, I, Dana, your thoughts on all All right, so one, um, he was prepared for that moment. He knew it was coming, right? He got the name a little bit wrong. The line that I thought was a little bit strange is when he said, but how many people are being killed by illegals? By legals. By, and I, I, again, that part was an on prompter, but there's a couple of times that the Republicans took the bait on a couple of things. One was on Trump tax cuts. So I was talking about the tax cuts, like, oh, I thought, I thought you wanted those tax cuts, right? I thought that was a little bit skillful. Mm -hmm. That was like one of the moments where I can say, I thought that was pretty good, and also on immigration. But I do think that this was 
a polarizing, divisive speech, and it was meant to be. I started the night. So I included that clip because you can even tell with Dana Perino, um, she's basically saying it sounded like he just mispronounced her name, not got it wrong. I don't think he thought her name was Lincoln. I think he just, you know, uh, Lake and Riley or Lakin as a first name is a little unusual. I've never heard it before this uh, woman and it's a lovely name. I just have never heard anyone named Lakin before. It's a bit unusual. Um, and he, you know, he stumbled over it. Um, he was also being yelled at. So his adrenaline was probably riding high and you're trying to give a speech. You're under so much pressure. And then you've got uh, basically, I'm going to say a crazy person. I'm going to describe Marjorie Taylor Greene as an unreasonable person who's promoted conspiracy theories. And let's just talk about her for a minute, shall we? Um, I cannot stand her because she also spoke at a convention rally type situation that was headed by Nick Fuentes. Nick Fuentes is a proud white nationalist and anti-Semite. And there she was on stage with him, like just beaming, so happy that somebody gave her a microphone that she didn't seem to care or do any research into the fact that she was speaking basically for neo-Nazis. Um, she's also made a number of anti-Semitic um, she's promoted conspiracy theories, the Jewish space laser, uh, something about the Rothschild family and all this other nonsense. She made a Holocaust statement uh, about mask wearing that was just absolutely hideous. She sort of apologized for that. So this is not a reasonable person. So I think it would be challenging to have her scream at you in this situation and answer coherently at all. Um, and I think what he was trying to say is, yes, she was killed by illegal, but thousands of people are killed by legals. That's what it sounded like he was saying. I don't really know because there was crosstalk and it wasn't clear. Not his best moment, but again, difficult circumstance. Now, this was a great sign because John Roberts, who again is legit, they did use the legit people. They didn't have any, like they didn't have Jesse Waters on this panel or that would be hilarious. They would never do that. They don't do that. I'll give Fox credit uh, when they have serious situations like this, State of the Union or um, for the January 6th hearings, they didn't have anybody like that on the panels. They had more of the legit news people. Um, but John Roberts and this one, you know, it's like they can't really tear this down. They're trying like hell, but they can't really do it. And this was John Roberts talking about the speech. It was it was yelly. It was rancorous. It probably turned a lot of people uh, off if they're uh, right-leaning independents or Republicans. But I'm just going to predict that when the reviews came in on this, places like the New York Times mm -hmm. and the Washington Post and the National Review and MSNBC and other left-leaning out outlets, they're going to say that this was the most brilliant State of the Union that he's ever given. Yep. Because he needed a political resurrection tonight. He went into this with the lowest approval rating of his presidency in a Fox News poll. He was underwater on every, every major issue. And underwater far enough that he needed to be uh, at least breathing nitrox, if not he in order to survive. It was that far underwater. That was kind of a perfectly orchestrated backhanded compliment of President Biden's State of the Union address, where he basically saying it's very effective for Democrats. And again, they're criticizing him for making it too political, even though it's an election year. And he's saying that that may have turned off moderate Republicans and right leaning independents. And you think to yourself, OK, so in the primary, I'm just going to throw this number out there. I haven't done the math on it, but let's say about 20 to 25 percent of all primary voters. And that's, again, the hardcore voters in the country so far that were Republican chose Nikki Haley over Trump. Great. So Biden was supposed to cater his speech to that specific demographic, which, by the way, Nikki Haley is by no shape, way, shape or form a moderate. She's a hardcore conservative who's not crazy. That's it. That's the difference. Um, she wants to cut Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security in some form. She said she would, I'm paraphrasing, but words to the effect of flatten Gaza. She um, wants to cut every program that we have, pretty much. She would sign a national abortion ban if one came her way. She's spoken a little bit softer about 
addressing abortion, but I would not call her a moderate on abortion. There's really nothing moderate about the woman except for she's not insane. And I did go to an event. Um, I got a comp for it. It was an opening event party with, this screwed up my week as well, Molly Jong Fast, Rick Wilson, and George Conway. And George Conway put it, my mother, again, is a huge fan of George Conway. I haven't even told her that I met him yet because she's going to be very excited. Um, even though she she's like, I know he used to be a conservative. I'm like, Mom, I think he still is a conservative, but um, he hates Trump. Anyway, she he basically said, and I would agree with him, if you look at all of the um, criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, you only need to have like five to have NPD and Trump has like all nine. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. And here's the other freaky thing about NPD. I'm going on a tangent, but it's worth it. NPD, people with narcissistic personality disorder, that's pretty much as far as you can go with narcissistic personality. It's just, you're all the way off the scale. Cult leaders, there's a connection with people with NPD being cult leaders. Cannot make that up. Google it. It will mess you up. You'll find videos on people who are diagnosed with NPD who are also cult leaders actually diagnosed with this. Okay. Whew, I'm coming down. But we're moving into the craziest part of the entire State of the Union address. And that would be, and I just made, I wasn't going to include it, but I decided to include it. I just made an, I, I just made an audio edit spontaneously, just off the cuff that I'm going to stick in here now. This is my edit of the, one of the craziest things I've seen in a while Katie Britt, Senator Katie Britt from Alabama, her Republican response to the State of the Union address. Now, I am was born in the 70s. I've seen a few of these. I come from a political family of union members who watched every single one of these. Um, th my parents are very politically active my entire life, still are. Uh, so I don't think I've ever seen anything this bizarre. This was my edit of it. It's a minute long. I just noticed the way she said a certain word and I went, you know, let's just let's just cut all those out and stick them together and see what happens. Here we go. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. One thing was quite clear, though. President Biden just doesn't get it. President Biden, we know that President Biden did President Biden's border policies of President Biden's senseless border policies. President Biden, and tonight, President Biden, Mr. President, enough is enough. We know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. Well, President Biden, and unfortunately, President Biden's weakness, the president has demonstrated. President Biden has failed. And what does President Biden do? The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. I mean, what the heck? What? I mean, that is a minute of 19 minutes that I cut her just saying, President Biden, President Biden. Now, I have a couple theories on what happened there. I think, okay, so my undergrad was in theater. My ex-husband is a circus clown. This is, I, I don't hold nothing back. My attitude is... You can't make fun of me if I own it like proudly, like a badge of honor, which I do. All of my eccentricity, I just own it. I'm a cat lady. I live in Brook, all of it. Okay. So um, <laughs> I studied every type of theater you could imagine. I've done opera, I've done stand up, I've done improv, I've done you name it. Okay. Musical theater, regular theater, dinner theater. I've done it. Crazy, crazy experiences I've done on stage. So a lot of experience in this one. And I, what her, her performance, which it clearly was coached and um, probably uh, directed like a dance almost. It, that's what it looked like. Uh, my guess, and I, I could be wrong, but I think she used like a theater person to come in and help her with her speech and delivery. And this person didn't really understand um, camera, the camera and how that adds to everything. And I, as I described it, she reminded me of a first semester drama student in college who decides, you know what, I'm gonna fulfill my dream. 
I'm going to be a theater major. And then she signs up for theater classes and like one semester in is like, hell no, I'm not doing this. Because they, they realize that being an actor is not every monologue you get to do that, which um, there were actresses, I knew them, who every single thing they played, they usually made fun of it. If they were a good actress, they would openly make fun of the fact that every role they played, they had to sob or die. There was one actress I knew in Chicago. I have no idea what happened to her, but she <laughs> she said to me once at a party, she's like, uh, that's not her voice. She didn't actually sound like that, but I'm going to do the um, the Brit voice, Katie Britt voice as her. She goes, I, my character, I've played a character that has died in the past nine plays that I've been in. The past nine plays. Because <laughs> this woman worked all the time. She got awards. She was very successful for like a Chicago theater actor, whatever, you know, as successful as that metric can get you. It's, just a very, it's so hard to be an actor. It's such a hard life. It just is. Most, most actors make no money. And it's just a constant struggle. And it's very difficult. And she was kind of there. But she did work a lot. And she said that. And I was I was just sort of like, I was complimenting her. And that's what she said. I just fell over laughing. And she fell over laughing. So she got it. But because um, <laughs> I tended to play, when I was working, I did nothing but comedy for the most part, which not that shocking. They're like, we need someone big who acts crazy on stage. Juliet. I'm like, hey, you need a big over-the-top character that doesn't have any nuance? That's me. Anyway. <laughs> You need a woman who's going to cry and then die in a play. That's not me. I never got cast in those. Never. Never. Anyway, um, okay, I'm making fun of myself. But I think that that's what's going on here. Another thing that I noticed about her breath, and then we will move on, because I could spend two hours on that monologue. I could spend two hours breaking that monologue down and still laugh at it because it was so insane. But one thing I noticed about her breath that was very unnatural, uh, that is part of it, it, tonally, everything was at 11. So it's sort of like, this is the analogy I used. I was just talking about it with my sister. When you watch Mommy Dearest, the classic cult film, Mommy Dearest, starring Faye Dunaway, one of the reasons why that movie comes across as a comedy and not a tragedy, which the story is tragic, but the reason why you laugh at it is because it never lets up. Every single scene is pushed to the extremes of melodrama to the point that you don't take it seriously, and then it just becomes silly because, like, every single scene is like, Tina, bring me the axe. You know, I'm not one of your fans. Okay, like, you have to know the movie, but that's every scene is life or death everything's going to fall apart every single damn scene. <laughs> so you start to just laugh at it rather than go, oh, that poor young woman, she's got that abusive mother. You're just like, come on. It's like clowns. Another great example of that same style is like Valley of the Dolls. You can tell I hang out with a lot of gay men. I'm going to reference a lot of campy gay men movies. The gay men like them, not all gay men, but it's a kind of, you know, there's a subculture of bad movie lovers. Uh, Another one would be showgirls. Everything's just way over the top, way too important. It, it just comes across as funny. It doesn't seem tragic. It just seems funny. I could keep using examples of this, but um, a comedy that tried to do that, uh, that uh, and, and comedy does this. Like if you watch Dodgeball, when they throw wrenches at people's heads and they fall over as if they're being hit by an actual metal wrench. Another great example of like, <laughs> that's how you play comedy, life or death. It's the same as drama, it's just with drama, you have human, you know, like a, a well-played drama has uh, you know, ups and downs and has a pace to it that moves. It's not every single scene is all the way to the extreme, which is Mommy Dearest. Um, so anyway, and that was this monologue. And I think what she was doing with her breath there, my whole point of going on this tangent, is when you study classical theater, you often have to say long phrases without stopping. Um, because you're getting iambic pentameter, or you're getting verse, you know, either with Greeks, Greek plays or Shakespeare, you have to go on very long periods of time without stopping or taking a breath because you'll screw up the rhythm of what you're saying. And that's what I was seeing her do because she'd go like, my husband and I sat on the sofa watching the State of the Union address with 
the president while we were sitting with our children and thinking about how he is destroying the country. And we know that he can't destroy the country anymore because we will vote him out. Like, that was two breaths. It's insane. Like, why are you doing that? That's not natural. People don't. That works in Shakespeare. That works in a Greek play. It doesn't work in real life. And really quick, if you want to have fun, another actor who used kind of classical style of breathing and emoting uh, would be uh, William Shatner when he was on Star Trek. He had been a Shakespeare-trained actor, and you can totally hear it. <laughs> it is that very specific way of reading his lines, that kind of, what are you doing? And that's where it's coming from. Because with classical theater, you definitely approach it a little bit differently than, you know, conversational, like 99% of other theater. But anyway, this is how Fox reacted to that crazy. Katie Britt, the youngest member of Congress, Republican member of Congress woman, uh, giving the rebuttal, which is always a difficult job um, for all of the loud sort of shouting, yelling that we got from Joe Biden, who's on the other side of uh, the political age group. This was soft. It was strong. Uh, she started by saying that Joe Biden's been in office longer than she's been alive. And then she said he doesn't get it. And she went one item after another talking about trafficking, talking about yeah. fentanyl, all of these issues she talks about and worries about with her family around the table. American dream has turned into a nightmare for American families, talking about fentanyl, talking about the border. Uh, at times she said about President Biden, y'all bless his heart. Now, if you're not from the South, that's, that's not a great thing. <laughs> uh, but she, uh, she delivered in a speech that's tough to give. And uh, I think that Republicans are going to say this hit all the notes. Yeah. And it did hit all the notes indeed, Brett Baer. Now, um, this next bit uh, was given to me, I was given a lead uh, by Resolute Square, which is the media division of the Lincoln Project. It's a separate organization, but they're affiliated. And uh, they also have a version of this podcast that you can consume on YouTube, which is kind of funny that anybody would want to listen to a podcast on YouTube because there's no visuals, but they do. They're, they're, a lot of people do. I'm shocked by this, but um, I'm part of that whole network over there uh, if you want to check it out. So um, they sent me this lead from Jonathan M. Katz, who is a respected journalist. Um, he made a TikTok video. So this isn't just a random TikTok video person. I know Katz's work. And so um, I watched it. It's seven minutes long. There's a link to it in the newsletter. And he looked into a pretty harrowing, horrific hideous story that a Brit Senator Britt told about a 12 year old uh, victim of human trafficking and um, he thought it was a little odd that there were no specifics she didn't give any about any of the information in the story and that she sort of implied that this was happening in the United States and that it was somehow related to Biden and the border crisis none of that is true so Katz looked into it and um, apparently Senator Britt has been telling the story for about two years. She's just repeating it whenever she gets a microphone. When she, when she could talk about the border crisis, she mentions this um, incredibly sad story uh, about a 12-year-old. Uh, now, Katz found the woman she's talking about, and the woman's named Carla Jac Jacinto Romeo, and she's a survivor of human trafficking who testified in front of Congress about the abuse she suffered in 2015. Romeo was forced into illegal underage sex work in Mexico, not the United States. And it wasn't even close to the border. Uh, Katz mentioned cities where she was moved around by this cartel. And it's in central Me Mexico for the most part. According to her own testimony, the abuse she suffered was from 2004 and 2008 during the George W. Bush administration. Now, it wouldn't have been George W. Bush's uh, responsibility as this happened in Mexico. It did not happen in the United States, and I'm not sure what the United States could have done about this. Um, and it, I'm very happy that this woman is free now, and she's basically an advocate for other women and other people who are forced into uh, sex work like this. And I, I have nothing but compassion and empathy and love for her. Um, Katz did not disparage her in any way, shape, or form, nor did he say that she was lying about her story. He does not believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. It's just 
Senator Britt was using this story as if it was relevant to our border crisis and that it happened in the United States, which is not true. So that was very interesting that she told the story in such a way that was highly misleading. And um, I think also very disrespectful considering the specifics around this story, because it has nothing to do with the border crisis. It has nothing to do with Joe Biden. And honestly, I don't, you know, it just seems like this woman is very open about what happened to her and she's not, uh, you know, she is an advocate for this. Why not name her? Why not just say who she mm -hmm. is? She didn't say who she was because then we could look it up and find out that she's sort of not telling the full truth here. Um, that's why she didn't use her name. So it's really gross on multiple levels. So we're going to move on to how PBS covered it. And I'm going to fly through this because I'm not going to do nearly as much commentary myself. Just sort of an observation of how differently the other network covered it. Just want to give a brief shout out to my sponsor. And who would that sponsor be? That would be the listeners of this podcast and readers of my newsletter. I am 100% free of any large sponsor, donor, or advertiser. I do not answer to anyone but the people who support this uh, podcast. I currently have 7,000 subscribers on Substack. That's not paid subscribers. Of course not. Paid subscribers is a tiny percentage of 7,000, but I just hit that milestone. So I just wanted to announce it. Very pleased with that, considering I was a complete unknown when I started this project um, and really had no idea what I was doing. It's just been that thing. Um, uh, if you can't afford to become a paid subscriber at my Substack for Decoding Fox News or my Patreon for Decoding Fox News, share the podcast with friends, share the newsletter. That always helps tremendously. Moving on to PBS. Um, the exact same timing for everything. The anchors were Jeff Bennett, a co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour, Omnia Navas, co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour, correspondent Lisa Desjardins, who's the White House correspondent for PBS, and Laura Barone Lopez, who also covers Congress in addition to many other things. They're both incredible. The panel was Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter, David Brooks of the New York Times. He's a columnist and Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post. He's the associate editor. He's amazing. So I'm just going to rapid fire go through these clips um, to sort of show how different they covered this. This is from before the State of the Union. And we know where things sit right now this has been the least productive Congress in modern American history. There's not much that is likely to unjam this Congress. And so he's talking to a body that is probably going to be doing little to nothing on any of these priorities. So it really is much more about messaging what he would like to see, not just for the next year, but for the next four years, rather than sort of imploring those sitting in front of him to help move an agenda ahead. So that, of course, is Amy Walter. Sorry, I should have introduced her before I played her voice. What she said is perfectly accurate. It is an incredibly do-nothing Congress. They've gotten absolutely very, very little done. One of the worst Congresses ever in the history of the country. Moving on to Jonathan Capehart. Again, this is before he said the speech. I think a majority of Democratic voters are going to be looking at the president and watching the performance. They want to see whether he has the energy and the, the vitality. Does he perform the job well? Which were, you know, to my mind, I think he's got a record to run on, and he's, gonna, and he's going to talk about that tonight. But he also has to convey the, the image of, even, even though I'm 81, I got this. And next we have David Brooks. He's sort of giving a prediction of what he wants to see in the State of the Union. I agree. I, I'm looking for orneriness. If you, if you remember, <laughs> a year ago, he got into back and forth with the Republicans on the floor. Right. And I think people consider that one of his best nights. So if you've got a chip on your shoulder, you might as well use it. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking to see if we get some of those kinds of exchanges. Here, Jeff Bennett asks Brooks about how he saw uh, Biden's defense of democracy. And I thought this was a very interesting clip, which is why I included it. And we expect the president tonight to talk about freedom and the defense of democracy, what he sees as the, the threats to democracy. He still believes that that is a, a resonant message, especially for this campaign. How do you see that, David? I think it is. I mean, I, I think the world is in, in a conflict between democracy and global barbarism uh, and domestic barbarism. Uh, some people want to play by the rules and some people like Vladimir Putin want to bend the rules so they have more power to use their authority in full force. So I think that is really the big story of the election, the big story of Joe Biden's presidency. And then I really loved how Amy Walter described the issue of abortion here, because I think this is very important to the Democratic base. 
The issue of abortion, what's interesting when you've talked about Democrats and Republicans, what they will tell you is the challenge that Republicans have had is that this issue is not seen necessarily as a medical issue mm -hmm. or within the confines that politicians want to put it in, talking about we can have these certain limits uh, on the practice at, at certain weeks, et cetera, but that it is about freedom itself, this idea that women had a right that is no longer available to them. So then we go to the speech, which he gave, and this is their commentary after the speech. And we're going to start with Jeff Bennett, just kind of wrapping it up much more succinctly than Brett Baer did. And that was a forceful and feisty State of the Union address. President Biden kicked off his speech with a focus on foreign policy, talking about the need to, to defend Ukraine. He highlighted the accomplishments of his first term, capping drug prices, infrastructure investments, COVID recovery. It was a speech that was heavy in economic populism. And he also mentioned the Israel-Hamas war, the plight of the Palestinian people. Let's go down. Now, Lisa Desjardins makes an amazing um, observation that was not commented on at all on Fox. And so this one was jaw dropping. And I think that tone was set early on when President Biden talked about January 6th. Uh, and said they were not successful. You know, those attacking the Capitol did not win. I was astounded to see uh, the, the all, nearly all Republicans not only were not standing while Democrats were standing, they were not clapping. Uh, they were not reacting at all. Uh, you know, and, and you would think if there isn't a unifying principle in this chamber, which itself was attacked uh, just three years ago, it should be applauding the idea that that attack was not successful. So there's a rule in the House chamber that she's not allowed to um, report using a camera in this instance. So she had to use audio. Little hard to hear. So I'm just going to go ahead and read what the transcript says. And she says this. And I think that tone was early on when President Biden talked about January 6th and said they were not successful. You know, those attacking the Capitol did not win. I was astounded to see a group of nearly all Republicans. Not only were they not standing while Democrats were standing, they were not clapping. They were not reacting at all. You know, and you would think that there isn't a unifying principle in this chamber, which itself was attacked just three years ago. It should be applauding the idea that the, that attack was not successful. So powerful words there from Lisa Desjardins. So the next up is Amy. There's a little bit of overlap between Fox and uh, PBS, which is incredibly rare. And this is Amy Walter just talking about you know, why his speech was so political. Most overtly political speech that I've heard given as a State of the Union ever. Um, and I think that it was d d really focused on one audience in particular, and that is on Democrats who worry that uh, the president doesn't have the stamina, doesn't have the fight in him to really run a robust campaign against Donald Trump. So in a rare moment, the legit news team and PBS are agreeing that, yes, Biden had a very overtly political State of the Union address, but yes, it was definitely targeted towards his base Democrats. Moving on, this is Jonathan Capehart's take on the entire speech. This was an epic speech. Epic. I thought last year's speech was a barn burner. Um, this one was that times 10. I think because the, the stakes were so high for him and for the White House and for his reelection campaign, but also to Amy's point, for Democrats, they needed to see this. I went back and looked at my text messages and I read this all to you. <laughs> we were four minutes in and my best friend in New York, Joe Versace, sends me a text message and all it said was, Miss Sophia, home now. <laughs> and for anyone watching who knows what that reference is, it's a turning point in the movie Color Purple. <laughs> Jonathan Capehart, always good for great quotes. He's amazing on television. Next up, I just love him in general. Next up, uh, this was said, I have to premise this, before, before they showed the train wreck that was Senator Britt's response. So this is Amy Walter describing um, Republican responses in general. They had not aired this yet. Nobody had seen her response yet. So this is so amazing. Uh, in this response. And as you've said, these responses, they're not, they're never really 
great for someone's political career, <laughs> right? It can go very, very, very well. Very hard, or very to poorly. Do. They're very hard to do. But what it says to the public, or at least to the, those of us who are in the mix, is this is somebody you should take seriously as part of the future of of the party. So the, the, amazing because she hadn't seen the train wreck of a speech that was about to happen. Um, <laughs> so it's like, how did she know? How did Amy Walter know? So uh, because, again, the commentary for both Fox and PBS were the exact same length, I turned them both into transcripts and then went and counted words, as I like to do. So the words used in the State of the Union address commentary, Trump was mentioned 10 times on PBS, 17 times on Fox. Biden, 33 times on PBS, 28 times on Fox. This one surprised me. Crime, once on PBS, zero on Fox. Border, 10 times on PBS, 25 times on Fox. Ukraine, five on PBS, four on Fox. Marjorie Taylor Greene, twice on PBS, five times on Fox. The word old, seven times on PBS, 15 times on Fox. Poll, as in a poll, a political poll. Um, once on PBS, five times on Fox. The word economy, nine times on PBS, three times on Fox. Israel, uh, four times on PBS, five times on Fox, it's about even. Russia, zero on PBS, three times on Fox. This one was incredibly telling. Democracy, 16 times on PBS, once on Fox. Lake and Riley, three times on PBS, six times on Fox. So, yes, I should have a, a bonus podcast that I'll be recording tomorrow about uh, Super Tuesday. It is very late, but it is a deep dive for super nerds um, in that I did go over nine hours and it did get really really weird at late at night because they had a a really fun democrat who just kept it's this woman they've had around before but not very often and she's a radio host and she's just amazing and she was just ripping on trump and praising democrats and it was just like glorious and i'm like this is happening on fox sure it's three o'clock in the morning but this is happening on fox so stay tuned for that one um, again, that's it for the podcast. I'm exhausted. The cats, Odin and Thor, the mascots of the podcast, send their love. If you want to find Decoding Fox News, I'm on Twitter, aka X, whatever, still call it Twitter, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook and YouTube. Facebook and YouTube are under my um, actual name, Juliet Jeske, spelled J E S K E, Juliet with one T. If you'd like to become a sponsor for Decoding Fox News, you go to my Substack. For Decoding Fox News, subscriptions start at $5. You get exclusive content. Or you can go to my Patreon and become a paid supporter there. They also get exclusive content. If you can't, just share the podcast, share the newsletter. I'm out of here. I'm exhausted. I will see you at the next podcast. This podcast crazy this week. Thank you so much. Resolute Square.